Um, Dr. Bell attended the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences College of Medicine um, for medical school and completed his residency at Duke University Hospital. He is a currently, uh, let's see, I lost my place. He is certified by the American Board of Pediatrics and was also a fellow for the American Academy of Pediatrics. Dr. Bell practices in Amarillo, Texas and has become an authority in the field of treating children under the age of 18 with various channelopathies. Since moving to Texas Tech, he has served as the Infection Prevention Medical Director for uh, Northwest Texas Hospital and Director of the West Texas Influenza Center. He works closely with state and local public health agency, agencies. Uh, he is the Regional Director of the Center for Tropical Medicine and Infectious Disease and Regional Chairman of the Department of Pediatrics in Amarillo. He works with an international collaboration in influenza research, as well as pursuing uh, research interests in epidemiology and dysautonomia. I think you can all relate to how busy Dr. Bell has been during the coronavirus epidemic, and we thank him for making this time to join us today. So just a minute, and I will get this over to Dr. Bell. I think. <laughs> Dr. Bell, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. You can hear me. Uh, turn, uh, is your, oh, oh, here we go. On? Share my webcam. Yeah, but there you okay. are. <laughs> I'm going to bow out now for a while. Okay. Um, and uh, I am a Luddite, so the uh, it's likely that I'm going to mess something up from a technology standpoint. I've already done it once this morning. So, uh, Please don't abandon me here. I will um, be in the background. I will try to show my screen and there's a button that says that. There is. Uh, not sure that it worked, but I did press the button. Let's see here. It does. Uh, oh yeah. So um, is, Linda, is that, uh, can you all see my screen? Yes. Yes, Dr. Bell, we can see it. Excellent. Excellent. And um, out of curiosity, because I had a video that uh, uh, worked fine at 10 o'clock last night and didn't work this morning. And um, uh, are y'all also able to see me? We can. I can see you. I think everybody okay. else can, too. Excellent. Excellent. Because we'll do a little live demo here in a moment. Uh, but um, um, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here, and um, everybody's, um, oh, sorry, sorry, just a second, I just lost my screen again. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here and everybody's patience with me as I try to work out the uh, the subtle details of uh, the computer here. Um, I need to be able to see my own Linda, do you recall which button I pushed to minimize myself? To minimize yourself, you're pretty small at the top of the screen now. Okay, I, I can't see the uh, my. Um, this actually you're, worked you're, fine. Can't see your slide. Uh -oh. Yeah, I can't see my slides. Uh. Oh, here we go. How about this? Let's see here. Hey, there we go. All right. You're big. Can y'all still see me? Yeah, we can still All still right. see when we see the COVID-19 for the periodic Perfect. paralysis patient. Excellent, excellent. I think we're on a roll then. The, okay. So I really do appreciate everybody's time. Um, I'm, I recall that the last time you guys were um, um, gracious enough to allow me to speak, I think I ran over by about 30 minutes. So I've actually yeah. a timer. And um, uh, we'll kind of run through, you know, just in case anybody has uh, been in a coma for the past 12 months, um, we'll try to get you up to speed. There's a, a pandemic going on. It's uh, caused by a virus. And um, uh, we get a lot of questions about COVID-19. And obviously with the, um, with the PPA conference, part of our concern is, well, how does that specifically affect our patients who have channelopathies and periodic paralysis? 
And um, so that's kind of what we're going to talk about here for a little bit today. I think there's a, um, um, first of all, I don't have any, any uh, commercial conflicts of interest. Uh, it's worth remembering that I'm not a virologist, and perhaps more important than that is the concept that science is never complete. Uh, we know that with periodic paralysis, we certainly know it with dysautonomia, and when we think about what's going on with the pandemic, what we're seeing is that uh, every day we learn something new and different and our understanding tends to evolve. Um, but what I'd like to do is to um, be able to review just some of the basics of COVID as well as um, uh, speculate a little bit on potentially COVID and periodic paralysis as a diagnosis. Now, I'm reminded a little bit of the rhyme of the ancient mariners. Um, uh, there's a, if you recall in the poem, there's um, uh, a boat that um, uh, is floating across the ocean and they've run out of fresh water and, and they lament the fact that there's water everywhere, but there's not anything to drink. And when we think about that in the concept of the pandemic, it seems like that we have data everywhere, but we're struggling to figure out what to uh, what to think. Uh, we actually have seen that uh, with the coronavirus pandemic, this truly is a uh, uh, science in real time uh, phenomenon. So we've seen that if you look at the decade prior to 2019, there's about 700 articles per year on uh, coronavirus. Uh, because obviously coronavirus is not a brand new virus, we just have a new strain. In 2020, there's been, we've averaged a thousand articles per week. And so uh, things that I say today, um, uh, our understanding may evolve as time goes by. Um, science is rarely simple and it's often messy. And so there's things that I may say that people may disagree with. Um, I guarantee that anything that I say today, someone can pull up some kind of article that would um, be an uh, argument against what I'm saying. But in general, we're trying to look at the overall preponderance of evidence to try to make our best guess as to the um, um, what's the the our, our understanding. So first of all, very briefly, then um, uh, this is a virus and not a bacteria for. Those of you who are English majors, um, uh, we'll just kind of run through some of the basics there. Uh, first of all, a virus has to get inside a, a host cell as opposed to uh, bacteria can multiply outside a host cell. Um, that's the reason that um, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, people can get salmonella from uh, a dirty uh, wash rag. Um, and if the, the dirty wash rag uh, that they used or that was contaminated uh, with chicken, um, is sitting in a uh, warm, moist place for a while, the actual burden of the bacteria will actually increase because salmonella is a bacteria and it doesn't have to be in a cell to multiply. Viruses, though, do have to be in a cell. Antibiotics work against bacteria. They don't against viruses. Uh, viruses are certainly more common than uh, common causes of infection than bacteria. Um, and there's, uh, just as some examples, we think about uh, influenza A, uh, causes the flu, that would be a virus. Adenovirus causes a sore throat, that'd be a virus. And in this case, SARS-CoV-2 is actually the name of the virus, and that's what actually causes COVID-19. So there's actually four groups of coronaviruses. Um, the first two, an alpha and beta coronaviruses, are the ones that actually cause infections in people. And again, these have been around for a long time. I think it was back in the uh, mid 60s, if I remember correctly, that um, coronavirus was first identified. Uh, and the alpha coronaviruses typically cause a common cold. So the uh, beta coronaviruses are the ones that we've seen causing outbreaks that uh, have the potential to create pandemics. Now, COVID is not actually the first beta coronavirus uh, uh, outbreak that we've seen. There was something called SARS, uh, which was back in 2003, 2004, if I'm remembering correctly. And it was actually very similar to COVID-19. It just didn't spread as well uh, from person to person. And um, uh, starting just a, well, probably about 10 years ago, we actually had a, um, uh, an outbreak in, of something called MERS-CoV, which was uh, mainly in the Middle East and it actually seemed to be associated with um, uh, camel exposure. And MERS-CoV also caused um, significant illness, but 
again, was not able to spread easily from person to person. Obviously, COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 is a little bit different in that it seems to be very well adapted to be able to spread from person to person, but all of these are part of the beta coronavirus family. So it's an RNA virus, it's not uh, segmented. Um, um, uh, the only reason that matters is that um, there's some types of pandemics that are driven by segmentation of the virus. Um, it has sort of an average mutation rate for RNA viruses. So you'll hear on uh, the news about that, the virus is mutated, all viruses mutate. And RNA viruses tend to mutate faster than DNA viruses. Uh, but um, COVID just sort of seems to be on average for RNA viruses, certainly not as fast of mutation as what we see with the flu or with HIV. Um, it also, these viruses in general tend to be temperature sensitive, meaning that heat tends to kill off the virus pretty easily. Um, and so that gives us some ideas when we think about decontamination protocols and things like that. And then I think the last thing to remember is that there's lots of different host species for coronavirus so that we actually see that uh, this particular coronavirus we think probably originated in bats, but the, um, uh, we actually see that um, uh, uh, cats can be infected. Uh, interestingly, probably dogs, maybe not quite as much. Uh, mink, if you happen to live on a mink farm, then um, uh, you're really kind of in a difficult situation right now because minks are certainly at risk of uh, coronavirus infection. When a virus tries to invade a cell, a human cell, remember it's got to get inside the cell in order to be able to uh, replicate. The way that it does that is initially by being able to bind two different receptors. And these receptors are very specific. Um, it's not able to just pick any receptor on the human cell to be able to bind to. In this case, it has to bind to something called an ACE2 um, and that allows the virus to be able to basically join with the cell membrane of the human cell and inject the content, specifically the RNA, into the human cell. Uh, this is actually a, a, a cartoon graphic from back in 2014 uh, based off the original SARS-CoV, which was the original SARS outbreak back in 2003, but it still illustrates the point of the ACE2 excuse me, the ACE2 being the uh, uh, receptor that it has to be able to bind to. If someone gets infected with COVID, then there's um, uh, usually about five to seven day latency period. That means that if I actually am exposed to the virus and got infected on uh, today, on Saturday, then I would uh, probably start developing symptoms somewhere between um, uh, Thursday and Saturday of this coming week. Uh, if um, um, uh, yeah, I could potentially have an infection later, or sorry, symptoms later or earlier though, because there's this really wide latency period before people start to, to um, demonstrate symptoms. And that range can go all the way from two days up to 14 days. That's why when you see the quarantine recommendations, if someone has been exposed to the virus, so a significant exposure, the recommendation is that you quarantine and you actually quarantine for two weeks. That's because it can take up to 14 days to be able to demonstrate symptoms. Now, it's probably also worth noting that if someone is in that latency period, they aren't necessarily shedding virus and therefore a test for the virus won't be positive, which means that you can't test your way out of quarantine. If someone is, if I was exposed to the virus today and I got infected, and someone tested me for the virus on uh, Monday, I might still be negative and not show any um, uh, positive test, but still come down with the virus two days later or a day later or six days later. So that concept of latency period actually is a big part of um, what determines our public health statements and um, uh, recommendations with COVID-19. I think a second thing you gotta remember is that um, uh, viral shedding begins uh, potentially two days before symptoms appear. So we have, it's estimated that up to half of the disease transmission, at least in the United States, is occurring before people actually develop any symptoms. So that's uh, shedding that in um, uh, transmission that's coming from pre-symptomatic people as well as those who will never develop symptoms. And so um, uh, that's why we can't just wait until people have symptoms 
to make the recommendations of social distancing, wearing masks, and things like that. Initially, the symptoms tend to be pretty mild. Uh, for most people, the um, uh, symptoms will remain mild. Uh, it's estimated that 80% of folks will have mild uh, symptoms if they get infected uh, or have no symptoms at all. Um, some patients seem to have an increase in symptoms in the second week of the illness, and that does um, um, correlate with uh, an increased likelihood of requiring medical intervention. But the uh, again, the vast majority of people, when they get infected, they're going to uh, have mild symptoms but they can still shed the virus. Typical symptoms that we would see are fever and cough and difficulty breathing. 90% uh, of adults with COVID will have one of those, at least one of those first three symptoms. Uh, folks can also have fatigue and muscle aches, headaches. Um, the inability to smell or taste is something that's somewhat unique uh, compared to, uh, for example, fever, lots and lots and lots of things can cause fever. A loss of taste or smell is something that uh, there's a shorter list of um, uh, diseases that cause that. And so if somebody has a new onset loss of taste or smell, then that would be something that would be um, uh, certainly concerning for a COVID infection. It's also worth remembering that, again, up to 40% of patients are asymptomatic and won't develop symptoms during the course of their illness. We also know that there's some folks who, who don't um, uh, do as well with the virus. Um, even though 80% of people who get symptoms are going to have mild symptoms, 20% are going to have uh, more symptoms. Uh, those risk factors for more complications from the virus include things like older age. Um, uh, I, I've seen an estimate that up to half of the um, total number of deaths um, have been related to folks over the age of 85. Um, so we see that older age is definitely a risk factor for complications. Uh, having had uh, or currently having cancer, uh, emphysema specifically, even more so than some other things like cystic fibrosis, but lung disease in general can be a problem. Folks who are immunocompromised almost uh, always do um, uh, more poorly with infectious diseases than others. Heart disease, um, the, the obvious ones are things like um, uncontrolled heart failure, uh, but even hypertension seems to be correlated with an increased risk of, of uh, complications. Diabetes is another one. And basically it boils down to, I think that about any chronic significant medical condition probably increases the risk of having complications with um, uh, COVID-19 if somebody is infected. It doesn't necessarily increase your risk of getting an infection, but it will increase your risk of um, uh, having complications. One of the questions I get quite frequently, uh, at least about three times a week is, can I get reinfected if I've already been infected once? And the answer is yes. Uh, this is data that again, uh, science in real time, we're still trying to sort this out, but there's clearly been um, examples of, of folks who have had one infection with a strain of um, a virus, and then a few months later, they get a second strain of COVID-19 and they get reinfected. So we can tell that it's not an infection that's just um, hung on for four months. It's actually a new infection. Now, I think it's also worth noting though that these are probably outliers. So of the, at this point, I think 30 million people that we've proven have had COVID-19 infection in the world, uh, we only have a handful that have actually, uh, we have good documentation of reinfection at four or five months um, uh, post initial infection. So everything in biology, of course, is on a bell curve. And so these uh, folks who are getting reinfected early are probably people who are off to the left of the bell curve. And that means that somewhere there's, a, um, uh, there's an average duration of immunity that would be in the middle of the bell curve, and we don't know what that is yet. We think that, uh, or my guess would be, that this is probably going to be somewhere around seven to 12 months after an initial infection that people would be at risk of being reinfected. But again, we don't have good data because the virus just hasn't been around long enough for us to be able to show that. So how's the virus spread? Well, as everybody probably already knows, 
uh, there's uh, a lot of ways the virus can spread, but primarily we think about large droplets as being the, the primary way that it gets from one person to another. Um, now, there is growing body of evidence that aerosols, which are really small droplets, can cause spread. And um, uh, there's at least still some risk of uh, oral contamination. So that's if somebody coughs and um, uh, touches a doorknob, uh, and then I touch the doorknob and then I stick my thumb in my mouth without washing my hands, then that also could cause me to have infection. But as time goes along, it appears that the large droplets in the aerosols are probably more of an issue than um, uh, the oral contamination. So uh, wiping down your cereal box with Lysol uh, probably is going to be unnecessary. If we look at what happens when somebody coughs or sneezes, there's uh, different size particles that emerge from that. Uh, we have these really large secretions. So if you cough or sneeze into a handkerchief and you take a look at it and there's something green and gooey there, uh, if you can see it, those are really big secretions. Those tend to come primarily from the upper airway. So that would be the nose, the um, uh, potentially the posterior or pharynx, and even the large bronchi in the, uh, in the lung. Well, those large secretions are pretty heavy and they're gonna fall to the ground pretty quickly. Uh, matter of fact, they're gonna hit the ground within seconds. And these are things that are kind of uh, large enough that they're visible to the naked eye. Uh, they're more likely to be generated by a cough or a sneeze rather than just talking. Um, and uh, they tend to have a lot of virus in them, but, um, but again, because they fall to the ground so quickly, we don't think that they're a big part of the uh, transmission. We also have what we call large droplets. Um, in this um, uh, picture of a sneeze here, the uh, large droplets might be kind of these cloud of, of um, stuff that you see coming out. And those large droplets are usually 10 to uh, 500 microns in diameter. Uh, there's kind of a medium amount of virus that's in those. They'll, they will fall to the ground, gravity still acts on them, but the, uh, when they fall to the ground, they usually do it uh, within about six feet or so. Now, this is not a sharp drop off that they fall to six or go to six feet and then just immediately plummet. Um, it's, again, something that happens on a continuum. So in Europe and in uh, many other countries, uh, the w, uh, as a matter of fact, the WHO talks about trying to keep one meter or three feet distance between um, uh, away from folks to prevent spread. And that's a reasonable recommendation. In the US, we do uh, six feet is the CDC recommendation. That's actually based primarily on older influenza data. Uh, but the, um, the thought is still that, that the further you are away from somebody, the less likely you are to be able to pick up one of these large droplets. Uh, these can actually be generated though by talking, um, maybe by breathing, certainly by singing or heavy breathing. Uh, and again, we think that large droplets are the primary vehicle of transmission. We also see that we can get small droplets. And in this case, the, uh, the small droplets here are um, uh, basically just uh, black spots. Um, that's a uh, scam call on my phone, sorry. Uh, but these uh, small droplets, as they float around, I assume that's a scam. Um, these small droplets, as they float around, they actually are uh, things that can stick around in the air for a larger period of time. Because they are smaller, they can actually uh, float around for even a few hours uh, and may travel up to 24 feet. Now, the good news is, is these small droplets don't tend to have very much virus in them. Um, but because they can be generated even by things like talking and breathing, we do think that they contribute to disease transmission. So just to kind of review here, we have um, uh, a couple of just uh, uh, diagrams showing that if somebody is um, uh, sneezing and sneezing typically generates more um, uh, material than what coughing does, about a fourfold uh, greater amount. But even uh, with uh, breathing, which is our, our, our uh, graph down at the bottom, we can get um, production of both aerosols as well as large droplets and the um, distance at least that the aerosol plume can travel may be up to 24 feet, especially with something like a disease, or sorry, like a sneeze or a cough. So how do we prevent disease spread? Well, again, we gotta think about how far the droplets and aerosols can travel 
And we also have to think about what the actual number of virus or the amount of virus it is that it requires or that's able to cause infection. Theoretically, a single virus can cause infection. But the, re the reality is that most of what we inhale gets stuck in the mucus in the lung is um, uh, uh, broken up by the innate immune system and actually doesn't cause infection. We don't know what the true inoculum size is, uh, so the average amount needed to be infected from COVID-19, but it's got to be, it, the average is going to be something more than one. And there's at least some data that if you're infected with a smaller inoculum size, even if you go ahead and get infection, infected, that you'll actually have milder disease than if you got a lot of infection or a lot of virus that you're exposed to. So it's kind of like if you drop a brick on your toe, it's going to hurt. If you drop a ton of bricks on your toe, it's going to hurt a lot. And so this was actually a, a nice little study done in Europe where the uh, uh, three different clusters of outbreaks, uh, those that are in green actually had a, uh, were in a situation where their inoculum size was actually pretty small. And they actually had folks that would either um, uh, turn positive and be asymptomatic or potentially had mild disease. Those who are in red and in blue tended to have more uh, exposure and those in the red with the most exposure. And you see that uh, that higher initial exposure amount, that higher inoculum actually resulted in more severe disease. So decreasing the inoculum size can actually be helpful even if you go ahead and get infected, which is why you're seeing more things in the news about ventilation. So the greater the amount of air exchange, the more the virus gets diluted and the lower the risk of disease transmission and possibly the lower the amount of, or the, the milder the disease. So in general, outside is gonna be better than inside. What about masks? Um, I think that around the world, there's not a lot of uh, debate about masks. So those of uh, who are uh, tuning in from um, uh, other places may not uh, feel that this is a very useful five minutes, but in the U.S., there's been a lot of debate about masks. And like with everything, the science is incomplete. However, we're going to go with the preponderance of evidence, which would suggest that there's two reasons to wear a mask. First of all, to protect those around you, and second of all, to protect yourself. Far and away, we think that the, the most efficient use of a mask is to protect those around you. So if I, I actually do a little bit of tuberculosis work for the state of Texas, and if I have a tuberculosis patient and I only have one mask, I'm going to put that mask on the tuberculosis patient and I'm going to go without because I'm going to better protect myself by making sure that the TB patient has a mask that um, uh, is close up around them. And the reason for that is that when we first cough, breathe, sneeze, anything like that, when the um, virus or when the um, secretions first leave the mouth, they tend to be at their largest size and tend to be the most likely to be able to get stuck, if you will, in the, uh, in the mask. So what we see is that almost anything that you put over the mouth and the nose of the infected person will decrease the risk of infection to others. There was a nice little study where they actually, uh, this was done in uh, Scotland, I believe, uh, just recently, a week or two ago, uh, where they uh, basically had this uh, apparatus set up that they would create droplets, they would push it towards a fabric sample, and they would see how well different fabrics worked. And the idea was that um, uh, you have these droplets, these especially large droplets, they hit the fabric, and they are some of them are actually able to make it through the fabric, but for the most part, the uh, fabrics would filter out the majority of the, um, uh, of the droplets. So in this case, they actually tested um, uh, about 10 or so uh, different types of fabrics. On the far left, you see is a surgical mask. Uh, and these are all compared to how many droplets get through if you don't have anything. So these are all compared to basically being unmasked. And what they saw was that anything that you put over your face is going to do something to prevent disease spread to others. Now, I think it's worth noting that um, uh, fabric number two is actually just a T-shirt. Um, and so this is not necessarily high tech stuff. Uh, it's, this is a low tech, just something over the, the mouth and the nose. And that actually is going to decrease your risk of being able to spread 
disease to others. Um, so you can be kind of creative with that. And uh, Halloween is coming up, so have a ball. It also is worth noting though, that it doesn't reduce the risk to zero. So just because I have a um, mask on does not mean I can't spread disease to others. We think there may be about an 80% reduction in disease transmission risk if the infected individual is actually wearing the mask. Now bearing in mind, asymptomatic folks can be infected. Therefore, we don't um, uh, have the option of just waiting till somebody develops a cough and a fever to put a mask on them. So with, uh, if we know that uh, masks are going to be able to prevent disease spread to others, well, what about yourself? So again, there's the uh, thought that two layers of anything would probably help. Uh, and it's clear that surgical masks or the um, N95 masks, or if you're in Europe, we call them FFP1, 2s, 3s, uh, so that those, um, uh, those higher quality commercial grade masks are going to do better than a cloth mask to protect yourself. But again, we think that, that almost anything will do something. So this is a, um, uh, actually a little study. It was kind of fun. Back in uh, February, uh, I went out to my garage and built a little combustion chamber in my garage and bought a package of cigarettes and, um, uh, and actually um, uh, made the cigarette smoke. I didn't smoke them, but I don't smoke, but the, uh, made the cigarette smoke go through a filter uh, made up of different types of um, uh, fabric. And then we collected it uh, at the back end of the filter to see how much particulate matter actually made it through. At the bottom, you see that there's no filter. At the top is a surgical mask. In between is just um, um, basically two layers of a simple cotton fabric. And you can see that um, almost anything does something to be able to uh, keep that particulate matter that's floating through the air from getting into or getting onto the uh, fabric. Now, it's not a real scientific study. Uh, my wife made me stop because uh, uh, everything I, I wore after that smelled like cigarette smoke. But what we think is based off of um, better data than what I had generated is that maybe a cloth mask, if I'm wearing a cloth mask and I'm interacting with someone who's infected, then I'm going to be able to decrease my risk by about 50% of uh, getting disease if I'm wearing a cloth mask. So not quite as good as putting the mask on the person who's shedding virus, but certainly better than nothing. Now, if both the infected person and the susceptible person are wearing a, a mask, then that probably decreases our transmission risk down to about one and a half percent. And that's based off of uh, some data that would suggest that with the typical exposure defined as basically uh, interactions within six feet of each other that are unmasked for 15 minutes or more has about a one in five risk of disease transmission if one person is shedding virus. Obviously, there's lots of caveats there. But if both parties are wearing a mask, then you drop that risk from one in five to about one in 75 or so, or about one and a half percent. So significant reduction if everybody wears a mask. What about large droplets? Okay, so the, or sorry, physical distancing. So again, large droplets may travel up to six feet. So I can actually avoid large droplets just by standing seven or eight feet away. Um, I'll have more exposure if I'm standing at two feet than I am at four feet. Because again, it's not like these droplets travel six feet and then just fall off of a ledge. Aerosols, on the other hand, may travel further. Um, so again, in general, the further away we are, the better. So as a mantra, in addition to good hand washing, I think it's worth thinking about that outside is better than inside. Masked is better than unmasked. Distant is better than close, and two out of three ain't bad. So if you're wearing a mask and you're outside, I'm betting you're in pretty good shape. If you're uh, wearing a mask and you're six feet away, you're probably in pretty good shape. Um, but we're really trying to get two out of three there to significantly reduce our um, uh, disease risk. So how do we make a diagnosis of COVID? Well, unfortunately, there's not any really clear-cut symptoms that we can use to make a COVID diagnosis. Uh, there's no symptoms that completely rule it out or rule it in. Uh, lots of things cause fever, lots of things cause shortness of breath. But um, uh, 
certainly the the inability sudden onset of an inability to smell is uh, suggestive of covid but not everybody has that particular symptom so we're really dependent on these lab tests and over the past seven months everybody's heard um, uh, so much about the different tests uh, we're going to briefly run through the differences um, uh, first of all the pcr test is the gold standard this is the one that takes a small sample and it actually amplifies the nucleic acid, the genetic material of the uh, coronavirus until the point that it's detectable. We think this is the most sensitive test and this is the one that, that came out first. Um, rapid antigen tests are ones that look at different viral particles and uh, can come back a lot faster, but unfortunately they don't amplify anything about the virus. So if there's a poor sample, then it's a uh, uh, not a very good test. And finally, antibody tests, we don't actually use for diagnosis of current infection. Um, it may take up to a few weeks for an antibody test to turn positive. So if uh, someone offers to uh, test and see if you currently have COVID and they offer to do it by doing an antibody test, uh, go ahead and turn them down because that's not gonna be helpful for making a current diagnosis. So PCR tests, again, these can be done either on um, uh, nasal swabs or saliva. Um, there's um, uh, uh, some really interesting work that's being done on um, uh, fecal samples as far as population uh, monitoring. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that we can use PCR and we've been using PCR since um, uh, the 90s for so many different types of um, uh, medical uses uh, that we've got a really good track record with this. For COVID, we don't really know what the sensitivity is because we don't have a great gold standard, but we think maybe 85% sensitive. It's got a low false positive rate, meaning that if it turns positive, you truly are infected with the caveat that people can still shed virus for up to two to three months after they have a, um, uh, an infection, but the virus may not actually be a live virus. So it may just be virus particles. And the reason is, is that uh, that sort of debris from the battlefield inside the nose can take up to three months before it washes away. So the cell turnover time in the nasal epithelium is up to three months. So we have had an early on, we had a lot of issues with people would test positive, we'd recheck them three weeks, four weeks, six weeks later, and they were still having occasional positive tests. But when we actually try to get that virus to grow in a cell culture, we can't get it to grow. So we think that uh, after about 10 days or so for mild disease, after people are infected, excuse me, after their symptoms start, we think that most folks are actually gonna be negative after about 10 days, uh, and they're not gonna be a risk of uh, shedding virus. Um, uh, and if you were to test them at 30 days and they turn positive, that would likely be a false positive. It may take days to get these results back though. It's really dependent on what your local resources are. So uh, we actually um, uh, locally here, we ended up um, uh, kind of having to develop a workaround to be able to do uh, more PCR testing locally instead of sending it out. It can be kind of expensive. Uh, the price tag varies a lot, but, um, um, uh, but it is the gold standard. On the other hand, a rapid engine test is a, um, uh, uh, really only a nasal swab right now is all that we have good data for. It doesn't have quite as good a sensitivity, but you can get your results back potentially in minutes, uh, and it's not very expensive. However, because the rapid antigen doesn't do any amplification of the virus, you're totally dependent on how good of a sample it is that you, um, that you took. So I actually did a little video of uh, swabbing myself. I, um, uh, Somewhere I've got a, um, a mock-up that the NIH sent me one time as being a certified master swabber because of a study that we did. Um, and um, so I'm just going to show you how I do a swab because I've had multiple patients that will tell me that, yeah, they got swabbed to uh, see if they have COVID and they basically took the swab and they sort of rummaged around in the top of the nose and that was it. And unfortunately, my video, I don't know what happened. I'm a Luddite but my video wouldn't go this morning, so I'm actually gonna demo this live. So if I make myself throw up, please excuse me. Uh, hopefully you can see this, because I'm only gonna do it once, and I'll try to kind of talk you through a little bit. I've got a swab here. It's about, uh, oh, probably seven inches or so, and we're gonna go in till about this much of it, 
is in my notes. All right, here goes. Go back. Ew. All right. At this point, the the swab is actually touching the very back part of my nasopharynx. I inserted the swab parallel to the roof of the mouth, but through the nose. So it's there. We let it set for a moment. We turn it. We pull it out a little till it's in the nasal turbinates. We turn it again. And then finally, we pull it the rest of the way out. And then we do it on the other side. So that's a good swab. If you got a good swab, then the tests tend to work pretty well. If the swab that your um, uh, clinician does just sort of wiggles it around in the front of the nose, that's not a good swab and it doesn't tell you anything about whether you actually have COVID. All right, well, what about vaccines? And I realize, I'm gonna wipe my eyes here. Um, if if um, uh, you're being swabbed and it doesn't make your eyes water or um, uh, come out with a piece of pituitary tissue, then it's probably not a good swab. All right, what about vaccines? Um, there are an amazing, uh, there is an amazing amount of science that has been put together in a, a short period of time on vaccines. Um, and, and we are in a fast forward um, uh, race to develop a vac vaccine. And it's truly remarkable how quickly the science has moved. The effectiveness of the vaccine when it comes out is really going, going to depend on those phase three studies that at least in the US on those that are going to be marketed in the US are still ongoing. Uh, now there have been uh, in both uh, Russia as well as in China, there's been approval for some vaccines uh, that uh, have not yet or completed what we'd consider to be a traditional phase three trial, but at least in the US and in uh, Europe as well, uh, we're really gonna be dependent on those phase three trials to be able to know how effective a vaccine is. The guess would be that it's gonna be between 50 and 80% effective. That means that if I get the vaccine, then I'm gonna have somewhere between a 50 to 80% reduction in my risk of getting COVID if I was exposed. Um, you may say, well, that's awful. If we're gonna do a vaccine, I want it to be 100%, but we actually don't have any vaccines that are 100%. There's um, nothing in biology that's a guarantee. And so uh, our typical flu vaccine usually has about a 55% uh, efficacy. Um, so if we get a 50, 60, 70% effectiveness on the, um, on the coronavirus vaccine, that's actually gonna be pretty reasonable but it's gonna depend on what the vaccine is that's going through. Um, there's probably gonna be multiple vaccines that come on the market in a short period of time. And uh, even though all of these current candidate vaccines require two injections, you can't cross over from one vaccine to another. So for example, if I got my first vaccine from the Moderna uh, vaccine, I can't use the uh, Novavax vaccine as a booster because they're gonna have a different mechanism of action and may have a little bit different target. So you have to use, um, the way we understand it now, you'd have to use the same vaccine for both the initial vaccine and the booster vaccine. And the timing even between those will depend on the vaccine as well. Some of them will be a 21 day uh, before you do the booster, some are gonna be uh, four weeks or 28 days for the booster. When are vaccines gonna be available? Um, I have no idea. I don't have any insight into that. Um, uh, I think that it's certainly possible that uh, we could have an initial approval based off of phase three studies by um, uh, late November or even December uh, here in the US. Um, but we're still looking, once we have availability, we still have to, sorry, once we have approval, we still have to have a significant increase in availability by ramping up production and getting that distributed all across the country. And in our little community of uh, 250,000 here in Amarillo, uh, one of our discussions at the health department is, all right, how do we give 500,000 vaccines? Uh, because remember, we've got to give two doses. Uh, and how do we do that over a, um, a two month period um, to be able to inoculate um, uh, the population at large? That probably isn't going to be happening until I would say late spring, early summer of 2021. So we're still in this for a while. And then, of course, at least in the United States, one of the big questions is, well, are the vaccines going to be safe? And I think the answer is yes. 
uh, based off what um, our standard processes are for being able to evaluate phase three studies, um, uh, these are gonna be safe vaccines. And even though it feels like that the uh, um, uh, so many things with the pandemic, again, at least in the US, have become politicized, it, when the vaccine goes through its usual and customary processes, we're gonna end up with the safe vaccine. Now, does that mean that it's not gonna have side effects? No, uh, anything that we do has the potential for side effects. Um, and there might very well be that somebody has an allergic reaction or that there's a very rare side effect that could occur. But I think the vaccine is going to be equally safe with other vaccines that are approved once it finally is approved. All right, what about COVID-19 and specifically periodic paralysis? Well, it turns out we just don't have any data. Um, I couldn't find anything that was specific to periodic paralysis related to COVID-19. Uh, we do have some data that uh, may be relevant, especially to uh, those who are potassium sensitive. So the, um, um, we know that um, uh, an interesting little study that was done by uh, Chen, uh, and this is actually, I think, cited on the um, uh, PPA website, uh, but about 50% of patients uh, that were hospitalized, at least, uh, this was studied in China, I believe, um, had um, uh, a decrease in their potassium levels uh, that were significant decreases, so that those potassium levels were below the normal value. Um, that's actually not too surprising, both from the standpoint of this involvement of ACE2, which actually has something to do with regulation of uh, potassium, as well as the fact that um, um, uh, any significant uh, illness or infection has a tendency to ramp up the stress response and the stress response, because of cortisol um, release, actually can also decrease the um, uh, serum potassium level and increase potassium excretion. Now, if we looked at folks who don't have COVID-19, if we go back to some of our old studies, we actually see that 40% of people who are admitted to the hospital for any reason will have a low potassium level at some point during their hospitalization. So the rate in COVID-19, a little higher than what the average is, uh, for non-COVID um, admissions, uh, and it's definitely something we need to keep a watch on, um, but it doesn't um, uh, necessarily tell us that everybody who has periodic paralysis uh, and has a uh, COVID-19 infection is gonna have a really low potassium. It's also worth noting that remdesivir, you remember we've got two medications that can act, that have actually we've got pretty good data, the preponderance of data would suggest that they are helpful and we've got randomized controlled trials, one of those is uh, remdesivir, and that actually shows a um, uh, about uh, one out of 20 patients who take remdesivir will get a drop in their potassium. That was as compared to, I wanna say it was one out of 50 in their uh, placebo control group. Uh, dexamethasone, we see that um, um, uh, certainly dexamethasone, um, uh, just like any other steroid can and probably will cause some decrease in potassium, Dexamethasone and remdesivir both are actually only approved for folks who are have severe illness. Um, there is actually a recent study that came out last week, I think, on remdesivir. There was an open label study uh, looking at moderate uh, uh, illness, but both remdesivir and dexamethasone are primarily being used for those who have been hospitalized. Uh, for example, dexamethasone, it's folks that are hospitalized and require oxygen that we can actually decrease the risk of mortality by using dexamethasone. And if someone with periodic paralysis um, uh, was hospitalized and um, uh, required the dex, then I would certainly suggest go ahead, and, go ahead and continue to do it. You're just gonna have to keep a close watch on the potassium if you um, uh, are, are hypokalemic uh, PP. All right, a little bit of speculation here, um, because again, I've got no data that's specific to PP that I'm aware of, and I would certainly welcome if, if other people have um, uh, better data. Uh, my observations on the handful of folks with PP that I know who've gotten COVID-19 is that uh, they may have uh, relatively mild disease or they may feel like they got run over by a bus, um, which is very similar to those who, um, um, uh, don't have PP. Uh, they may have mild disease or they may feel like they got ran over by a bus. So I think that the disease course in patients with uh, periodic paralysis is likely, if they get COVID, to be similar to the disease course that they would have with other types of infections. 
uh, influenza can cause uh, significant issues um, in periodic paralysis. Uh, certainly, uh, having um, anything that causes sepsis from a bacterial standpoint can be a, a significant problem. And so I think that our, our um, uh, patients and friends who have periodic paralysis need to be cautious and I think should be taking um, uh, care of themselves. Uh, but I don't see any data that uh, the periodic paralysis itself directly increases the risk of having poor outcome or death if someone were to get COVID-19. Now, one question that's arisen is, do you empirically change your medication regimen if you're diagnosed with COVID? And I think that's a great question. I don't know that I would uh, recommend that if someone is has mild symptoms and that they have, um, um, uh, with those mild symptoms, they get tested, they're, they're uh, test positive. Um, I wouldn't necessarily change anything in their um, uh, medication regimen at that point. On the other hand, if someone found that they were having to significantly increase their, their fast PP, should they uh, increase a little bit some of their maintenance medications? Well, that's certainly something worth talking with your doctor about. Um, but I think as far as a, a blanket statement that uh, you should increase your potassium intake or, or change your maintenance medicines because of a COVID infection, I think it's premature to say that that is a uh, standard um, uh, recommendation. So what can we do to stay healthy? Um, I think first of all, um, uh, we try to avoid unnecessary social contact. Now, this is difficult, right? Because our, our prior presenter was talking about how important it is that um, uh, we take care of our, our caregivers, uh, caring for the caregivers, how important it is that, that um, uh, these human connections and so people, humans are social creatures, right? We depend on those social interactions. Uh, but I think in, in this situation, I think that if you have unnecessary social interactions that you can avoid, then I would avoid them. Um, so especially things that are uh, where you have large groups of people that are in indoors, uh, places that um, uh, folks are unmasked, um, those might be things that, that you want to avoid. I think that we also, though, uh, need to stay connected. Um, I think there's a real risk of, of um, uh, people being isolated. Uh, we see that those uh, issues with mental health that happen with any chronic medical condition have been exacerbated by the isolation that comes of having a pandemic. And we've seen this um, uh, across the board, really, with all chronic illnesses. So folks have to be able to find ways to stay connected, uh, even though they may be avoiding some of that physical social contact. I think we need to stay active. We know that um, uh, both staying active and staying connected to um, uh, our support group are able to decrease our stress levels. We know that stress, um, because of its effect on the uh, sympathetic nervous system and subsequent auto, excuse me, uh, neuroimmune reflex effects, um, um, can affect the way the immune system works. So if you wanna keep your immune system healthy, uh, try to be able to manage stress, and that includes things like staying active, appropriate exercise, uh, staying connected to uh, your support group and to your loved ones. Likewise, getting enough sleep. Um, sleep deprivation actually is uh, directly linked to changes in how the immune system functions. Um, and um, uh, so making sure that we're not spending all of our time binge watching on, um, on uh, Netflix uh, during a quarantine. I think that uh, good diet, obviously, um, of course, our, our PP patients and friends are, are, I think, oftentimes the best amongst all of us as far as being able to stick with a good diet. Uh, it's kind of you just have had to learn how to do that. Um, but um, I think keeping that good diet and making sure we have a healthy diet. Um, I have not seen any compelling data on different supplements. There are lots and lots of things that have been promoted. Um, I think that as a general rule, if you have a specific deficiency, if you have a vitamin D deficiency, it's worthwhile to take vitamin D. Um, I think that um, uh, likewise, if you had a zinc deficiency, I would suggest taking zinc. Otherwise, I just don't know that there's enough data to be able to say that people need to be taking this particular supplement or that supplement in order to specifically ramp up the immune system. Uh, there may be a point in the future where we have better data on that, but right now I just really don't think we have the data to make that kind of a statement. And with that, then, I guess I would um, uh, go ahead and, and time out, and I would love to be able to open this up to uh, any questions that folks might have. Um, I've 
specifically tried to stay away from um, uh, a lot of the the uh, hardcore data on therapies um, because I think that therapy data is really something that um, uh, uh, is a a uh, moving target. Um, I think that um, it's something that you need to be able to have a conversation with your physician if you were to be infected. And uh, so I tried to kind of focus on things that I thought would be helpful from the standpoint of taking home as a, um, uh, a patient or as a uh, community member who might be exposed to PP. But I would with that be um, happy to open this up uh, to um, uh, any questions. Um, and uh, Linda, you're gonna have to help me figure out how to, um, we talked about a chat room. Uh, yeah, how, about, how about if I just read you some of the questions that have come in, Dr. Bell? That sounds great. Okay. Um, first question is, Dr. Bell, I have a three-year-old trach nocturnally vented G-tube son with congenital myasthenia syndrome, hyper-PP, and PMC. Episodes are controlled with Diamox and Salbuterol. Um, the question is, is it safe for him to attend preschool? His medical team is saying it's safe. Um, so I, I guess, uh, so first of all, you know, and I say this to, uh, when I'm covering the, 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 uh, hospital all the time, um, you know, ask your nurse if they, uh, if you have a question, if they don't know the answer, they'll come to us. And if, and if I don't know the answer, I'll make something up and you won't ever know the difference. Um, uh, the other thing that I always say is, um, uh, work with your, your uh, doctors and, and um, uh, develop a good trusting therapeutic relationship with your doctors. Um, I don't know in that particular situation with your son um, if that's safe or not, right? I've never met your son. I would say that um, uh, when I have a patient who, for example, um, uh, I have, oh, I think currently four children that I see, um, not from PP standpoint, but for other reasons, that are uh, chronic vent uh, patients, um, uh, I, would, I would say that uh, in, in those kids, I've recommended that they not attend school. Um, and so when you have a chronic ventilatory state, whether that's due to lung damage, like um, uh, if a child has um, uh, lung disease of prematurity because they were born early or, uh, and also have cerebral palsy, or whether it's because of a, um, uh, a neuromuscular issue, uh, either way, you tend not to have as much pulmonary reserve. And even though children in general have done much, much better with, um, uh, with uh, COVID-19 than what adults have, I still think that in the situation, if I was seeing, um, uh, and I've had this conversation with patients of mine who have a vent, and are trached, and um, uh, I've recommended that they not attend school, um, and they actually do uh, online um, uh, learning. That is really, really difficult, um, and I totally get that, and especially for like uh, therapies that they may be getting at school, speech therapy and occupational therapy and physical therapy. We've been trying for months to do those things online. They are really hard to do online. But either online school, uh, potentially having the therapist come to the house, potentially shifting to where you're using a private therapist instead of the school-based therapist during this time, uh, homebound services, uh, depending on the state, um, homebound services will sometimes provide a therapist to come to the home, which is different than online um, uh, schooling. But I do think that if a child is a chronic um, uh, vent-dependent child, they have less pulmonary reserve. And even though in general, kids do much, much better. And I don't think that your child would be at any increased risk of MISC, which is the um, uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome um, of, associated with coronavirus, MISC. Um, I don't think your child would be at increased risk of that. I do think that um, uh, if we had something, uh, just like if, if your child got the flu, um, that's going to be potentially an issue that um, um, because we don't have as much pulmonary reserve, and I would tend to lean on the side of, of probably not going to school if I was the physician. Talk with your doctor about it, see what they have to say. Uh, if, if they have a good feel for what, the, um, uh, what your child's actual um, pulmonary function is, now 
they're too young to be able to uh, do pulmonary function tests. But if, they, if they've done forced expiratory volume and they say, you know, he actually does great. This is really just an upper airway obstruction is the only reason that we have the trach. And it's the only reason that, that, um, um, that um, uh, we do the nocturnal venting. Maybe that's a different story. But, but without knowing some of those details, I think I'd be a little bit cautious. Thanks, Dr. Bell. The, this question is going to go back to actually one of your previous presentations. And um, Michael would like to know if there are any updates on links between hypermobility and dysautonomia and PP. Yeah, great, great question. Um, so the, um, uh, the short answer is, is uh, no, at least not from my uh, standpoint. The, uh, I haven't seen anything new in the literature. Uh, we actually had uh, three studies that we'd kind of drawn out, one of which we'd gotten started. And uh, of course, we started enrolling in it in, uh, I want to say January. Uh, and this was basically just trying to develop kind of some normative data to be able to take a look and compare uh, different types of hypermobility and just really get a better idea of some baseline normative data. And, um, uh, and as you might imagine, um, uh, research starting in January uh, kind of took a uh, back seat um, by the middle of February. Uh, so I am not a, actually aware of any any updates on that. Uh, again, for those who um, um, were fortunate enough not to have suffered through my last presentation, um, the, the, the hypothesis is that um, uh, that hypo, uh, excuse me, that, that hypermobility, that excess um, uh, ligament laxity and joint movement uh, certainly seems to be associated with trouble regulating the autonomic nervous system. And that um, when we look at periodic paralysis, then uh, trouble regulating the autonomic nervous system could potentially explain common symptoms that we see in patients with periodic paralysis that, that don't make uh, or aren't easily explained by the, um, um, by the actual channel ion, or the ion channelopathy. Um, so uh, issues, um, uh, you know, if, if headaches are more common in, in periodic paralysis, well, that's not really a ion channelopathy thing. If um, uh, dizziness was standing, that may not may not be as much of an ion channelopathy thing, but those would certainly be explained potentially by autonomic regulatory issues. Um, and Michael, to my eternal chagrin, um, I have not done anything useful in, um, uh, it feels like now, uh, more than half a year. Um, the, uh, we hope to get those, those um, studies kind of up and going again. Um, and as a matter of fact, we actually had to change. We ended up having to close our uh, radiology suite because our, our radiology tech was, was uh, a high risk person. And, and so we've, we've now negotiated where we're using a, a little different radiology suite. And I've trained their folks on how to do some of this, the uh, imaging, but uh, I don't have anything new for you. And I'm very, very sorry. Okay, I have one, one last question for you, Dr. Bell. Um, Lois, a good friend of mine, says that she has a serious muscle, muscular reactions to flu vaccines and no longer takes these, but she's wanting protection from COVID-19. Uh, and she's wondering whether or not she should get the vaccine or not. Uh, do you have any advice for her on this? Yeah. So, um, you know, Lois, I... I Great question. Um, uh, there is a, um, uh, a lot of, of um, difference in how the vaccines and how most of the vaccines are being produced compared to the way that we make the flu vaccine. Um, that being said, the, um, um, I'm reminded I have a, uh, currently a, um, uh, uh, one of my residents who is, um, uh, used to have a job back uh, right after he graduated from high school and he was an undergrad. And he had this part-time job where he was a roller coaster tester. And he was telling me about it the other day. And what they would do is they would get on the roller coaster and, and it was him and a, and a couple of the uh, roller coaster engineers. And they would um, get on the roller coaster. And it was the first time that the roller coaster was run with anything besides a test dummy on it. And, um, uh, and they would go zooming over and, and they would turn the, the speed up and down in order to make sure that the, um, uh, that the roller coaster worked. Um, and, and that is um, uh, incredibly frightening to me because uh, I don't like roller coasters. I would suggest, I think, that um, um, uh, 
although I, I certainly think that it, at some point there's going to be, um, um, I think there's going to be better data uh, for you in particular. Um, uh, as someone who has always tolerated vaccines very easily and well, um, I plan on getting a vaccine as soon as one's available. If I was somebody, though, who had um, uh, historically not done well with the vaccine, I might actually not be the one who volunteers to test the roller coaster. I think I would wait until um, uh, the amusement park's been open for a while and lots of other people have gotten on the roller coaster and make sure that they tolerate it fine. Uh, and then, then I think I would um, uh, climb on and pay my money and get the, um, uh, get the vaccine. I think that um, the other thing to bear in mind with the vaccine is that perhaps even more so than the individual protection that we would see coming with a, um, uh, with a vaccine, the community protection has probably even a greater impact. So if we were able to get 50% of the um, uh, population of the U.S. to be, um, um, uh, ideally, let's say that we, we got 75% of the population to take the vaccine and that that vaccine was 70% um, um, uh, effective in being able to prevent both disease acquisition and, and virus transmission. Then over the course of a few months, because of that built-in protection and the effect then on the uh, rate of spread in the community, what we would actually see is that the um, R value, that's the number of new people getting infected from one person who has an infection, would drop below one and we would see that the virus would start to die out. Not that we're ever going to entirely get rid of this virus. Uh, at this point, it is baked into our ecosystem. But it would get down to the point that our, um, um, our risk of getting uh, disease um, would be significantly decreased compared to what it is without a vaccine. So, you know, I, I, it's a personal decision, I think. I, I don't know for sure what to tell you, except that I probably wouldn't be the first one to sign up. I certainly also would not say I'm never going to get a vaccine because I did poorly with the flu vaccine. Um, I think you are gonna need to watch and wait and see. But bear in mind that there is a glimmer of hope in that we're going to see benefits to decreased disease transmission because of more immune people running around in the community, even if you personally don't end up getting a vaccine. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Bell. It's been a pleasure as usual. You've entertained us and you've given us so much valuable information. So thank you. Well, thank you. And I think I'm gonna go blow my nose now. Uh, <laughs> <at the moment. laughs> okay, thanks so much.